Thank you, Jens. I thought I'd start with this, actually. This is something we usually cut out of our pictures of the Earth because it's nothing to do with the weather. So we normally take it out, but it's kind of cool. So sometimes it's there. Um, and sometimes we use it to calibrate the satellite. So we use it to test that the meteorological instruments are working well because we know what the moon looks like. Um, yeah, so I'm from UMETSAT. We are U uh, Europe's weather satellite organization. Um, most of you, I suspect, won't have heard of us. We serve the National Meteorological Services um, to support them in their forecasting effort. And this is an important part about where we start from. So this is the night of October the 25th, 1859. This boat is the Royal Charter. It has sailed from Australia and is on its way to Liverpool. And it's just off the coast of Wales. So it's very, very nearly home. It's a day's sail away from home. A big storm kicks up. 450 people on this boat lose their lives. A further 800 across the UK and northern parts of Europe lose their lives. A hundred odd ships are destroyed. So this is a destruction of life and property and therefore livelihood. And this is, this is where we start as, a, as an agency. So we're set up um, and all the weather services are set up now to assist the protection of life and livelihood. Right now, at this kind of time, so 1859, is the kind of the beginnings of operational meteorology. Data are starting to be shared between places. And the ideas of how can we forecast the weather is starting to become more and more prevalent. Partly due to this, um, not the guy on the pole, the pole and the wires, right? The telegraph. What the telegraph enables is lots of data to be moved around. So observations from around different places in a country or in a continent can be shared and in almost near real time. Meteorologists are able to know what's the weather doing right now, which is the beginning of good forecasting, knowing what on earth is going on right now. Now, in the forecasting trade, and you can also become uh, weather forecasters really quickly, if anyone asks you, what's the weather going to be tomorrow, just say the same as yesterday. Right? It's not a bad place to start. Or the same as usual for this time of year. Right? It helps if you know what usual is for the time of year if you're going to do that, which is why collecting the data helps. If you're going to be a forecaster, though, you have to beat those two things. You have to do better than that. Those two things, climatology and persistence, don't do you good stead for big storms like this one. The stuff that comes up really quickly. What's the, you know, what's the weather going to be like the same as yesterday? Not going to get the big storms. What's interesting here is you've got the guy climbing the pole. Um, this is from the US National Archive. I think he's trying to hack the system. <laughs> I love the caption where it says, uh, you know, he's doing all of this, so the connection, which is broken, can't be seen from the ground. And of course, in this sort of setup where you've got the telegraph and what have you, you haven't got an open system. You haven't got what we're trying to get to today, which is open data, data available for all. So it's still within a closed system, but round about the mid-1850s, this is what you're seeing. This is meteorology starting to explode. You're able to move data around continents. You're able to get a near real-time picture of what the weather's doing now. This does two things. This helps scientists understand what the weather does. You can develop the meteorological theories. And it also helps you then know what's going on now so you can forecast what's going to happen next. This doesn't cover the oceans, though. You can still hide a big storm. You can still hide a hurricane. Until this. This is the 1st of April 1960 when the first meteorological satellite is launched, Tyros 1. So this is an incredibly exciting picture. Until this point, no one's ever seen what a whole weather system looks like from above. Those satellite pictures you may have seen on television or in books or in the papers of nice big cloud systems moving across the Earth. No one's seen that until 1960. We've only been looking up. Now we get to look down. This is incredible. And this starts the moment where the observing of the Earth system so that we can see all of these storms, all of these hazards, 
and then start to monitor and warn, which is incredibly important, starts to kick off. We quickly follow. This is us. You met Sat, so we're Europe's weather satellite organization. Weather satellites are incredibly expensive. So all the nations there in Europe, so we have 30 member states, come together so that we can work together to have satellites. The picture up there you see is a control room with one person in it. That is a happy control room. We work incredibly hard to make sure that the control room and the control environment, everything's working. Because that's what we're about. We're about data from the satellites and out to users just like that all the time. Which does make us quite conservative as an organization. It makes it very hard to change because we're tuned so that the weather services can get the data all the time. And this is what we're about. We're about looking after the spacecraft when they're up there in space, making sure they're happy, and the data, getting the data out to our users. <coughs> and this is us. So we can now see this is one of the first images from our what we call the geostationary image, so looking at our part of the world and focused in on a, a hurricane in the Caribbean. And these are the sorts of things that we're looking at all the time and sharing with our users all the time. Our prime weather users are the weather services around the world. Now, if you're a storm, there is nowhere to hide anymore. And this is due to global cooperation. So we look after the bit in the middle, and there are other satellite operators that look after the bits around. It's all part of global data exchange. Okay? But again, this is set up to work within the meteorological community. So when we launched the second generation of these uh, satellites, we had this great idea of opening this up a bit. And what we do is we'd use the meteorological satellite as a uh, telecommunications satellite as well. So you would be able to buy, at great expense, a satellite ground station, point it at the weather satellite, and get the pictures out. Very cool. But you probably have to have quite a few euros in order to be able to do this. And we have our own um, processing link as well that gets stuff back to us at the ground station, the main ground station. And we're also collecting data from other places. So we're starting to use the weather, site as a, a weather satellite as a way of getting lots of data to you, as well as the satellite pictures, which is kind of cool because the satellite pictures by themselves gives you a picture, but this isn't integrated science. We want data from all over the place. <coughs> Problem is, you see the four kind of black boxes over here? didn't quite work. And this is the little failure. There was an idea knocking around at the time to start to use normal off-the-shelf satellite television equipment in order to broadcast this data. Those were the things that were meant to transmit the data from the spacecraft to your nice, big, expensive satellite receiving dish. Didn't work. Brilliant. This is brilliant. Because the plan B that's being worked on now has, to, now has to become plan A. So this is, a, I think, partly a story of innovation. You can have these nice ideas. You can think, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this. This will be great. But actually, sometimes the universe gives you a very big kick, and you, you really have to do it. And so what now happens is you just need one of them, standard satellite TV dish you've got on your roof. And bang, we now have users all around the world Many, many hundreds of users. Some of these users are amateurs. They're people who are doing this for fun. Got a satellite dish on the roof, get it, getting all the data. And the amateur users are quite fun because they've got the time to find every mistake we make, <laughs> which is great because that's good feedback for the operational users. So what this does, what this error does is really open up our dissemination system by reducing the cost. It really opens it up. It opens up to weather services around the world. So this is the system that all around Africa people use to get the data as well as amateurs. So we've now got other users who are coming into our world. Now, that's one of the problems, people having to come into our world to get the data. So we're working hard to you know, get more data on the website. We've got a web map server that we've just launched. Play with it and give us feedback. Really useful, because then we'll change it so it's more useful. Really, really useful. So we've got a lot more people using the data. Massive explosion. And then what happens is bang again. Other people start going, hey, You've got a great way of getting data to operational users who need to use it. Can I use your system to disseminate my data as well? So you can now get computer model output data. You can get data on the state of the Earth's atmosphere. You can get statement, uh, data on the Earth's ice. You can get data on land from a whole range of providers, not just us, going through this system. 
So what's happened is you've now got this massive explosion of data, and you've, you can now have, if you need more data, 200, kilobytes, uh, 200 gigabytes a day of the stuff across a whole range of Earth in, um, and Earth-observing disciplines. And it's there, and it's available to you almost no matter, no matter where you are in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So this whole tiny little error, tiny little failure on a spacecraft has really helped us to open up our data. The whole conversation about big data in other parts of society is really pulling us to open that out, because at the moment, we're still tuned to work with weather services. Why? Because they're in the protection of life and property business, and that's the main people we serve. But opening it out to serve a wider science community is important to us. So this is you. So I'm assuming that there are very, very few meteorologists in the room, and almost no one who works in a National Weather Service. So you're the people, you're new to us, you're not the people we're used to working with. So your feedback really does matter to us, because that's going to help us to be able to learn how to address wider communities than we do now. Coming back to this storm, these, start, these types of storms do happen every so often. There was a lady um, a while ago called Janet Abramovitz who wrote a book, um, and she was arguing that there's no such thing as a natural disaster. There's plenty of natural hazards, but it's not a natural disaster because it's about people getting in the way of hazards that creates a disaster. This sort of thing really shouldn't happen today, and it doesn't. Um, October uh, 2013, this is tropical, uh, not, not tropical, sorry, Storm St. Jude or Christian that was traveling across Europe, very similar size to the storm that caused the Royal Charter thing. In the UK, two people were killed. In the charter storm, that was 800. And that's the difference between having a, a good weather service that can give warnings to a government and a whole infrastructure that exists to manage these sorts of warnings. And that's a lot of what we're about. At the beginning, the very beginning, our hosts um, told a story about working with a uh, company on having the best weather app. And actually, that turned into something out else. Actually, there are very few people who need to know what the weather is. Invariably, you need some information so that you can make a decision. And that's what's going on here, is actually having the information to make decisions about what should we tell people to do and not do to, say, to stay safe or to properly exploit their, their environment. So that is what we're about as an organization, really. We're about looking after the spacecraft. We're about the data. But we're also about contributing, contributing to the system that keeps us all safe and economically active. But there's also one of the great privileges of playing with this data is it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much.